My name is Jason Cook. I am one third of the ownership of Taze River Brewing and I also brew beer. And I'm Corey Patterson. I am not any part of the ownership and I also brew beer. Kind of our vision from the start is great beer, great food, uh, great environment, great atmosphere, create a destination. We're coming up to our uh, fifth anniversary um, on February 6th. So we'll be five years, five years running. Our experience with Blickman Engineering and the support that they offered is from, from the get-go, they have been involved every step of the way. When we gave them the designs to our brew house, uh, to how many tanks, to our requirements for glycol, for our brights, all those things, they were able to come in and work with us and help facilitate. That was huge in getting us going because I didn't have any real practical experience with the industry, so uh, their knowledge coming in was was fantastic the whole bookman crew on our first brew day um, they were here to get us you know put us through the paces of the system the seven barrel uh, system we have here seems like a good fit because uh, we have a pretty decent sized restaurant and tap room so we obviously want to make sure that they're uh, uh, getting taken care of uh, and now that we're doing a little bit of distribution um, we have right now just enough excess capacity out of the seven barrel brew house to be able to get some beer out and uh, out into the city and, and territories without really stretching ourselves as far as not having enough inventory here or stretching me and Jason by brewing seven to 10 times a week. So I was back and forth between a seven and a 10 initially when we when I were first thinking about it and decided on the seven, um, just like thinking that like a target being around a thousand barrels a year for kind of max capacity, what we'd want to do. And today Jason's working on brewing I'm working on getting his fermenter ready, doing some other cellar work. Uh, we are very fortunate that we have a lot of space to work around each other. We're not cramped at all. Uh, at any given point in time, I'll be cleaning, like yesterday, I cleaned three tanks uh, while Jason was out and about. But theoretically, Jason could come in, he can run a brew day just like today. I can clean some tanks, get things transferred into our brights, and we don't necessarily step on each other's toes. So just purely from a size standpoint, we have a lot of good operational efficiency. I might have the distinction of working on more commercial Blickman systems than anybody else on the planet. Uh, I've worked with the, the 20 gallon system. I've worked with the one barrel system. I've worked with the three barrel hybrid. I've worked with the five barrel hybrid. I've worked with the five barrel hybrid plus, and I've worked with our seven barrel system here. Uh, you can have all the shiny tanks and, uh, in the world. But if you don't have your hoses, your gaskets, your clamps, your valves, uh, I think that's one of the first things that gets forgotten in a build out that a lot of folks who might necessarily not already be in the industry don't even think about. The, uh, the excellent thing about Blickman is when they hear things like this, they, they actually respond to that feedback and try to put a product out into market. Uh, the three and a half and five barrel system specifically, there's a lot of hoses and clamps you have to move around throughout your brew day at any given point in time. A couple of years ago, the folks decided to try to solve that problem, so they came up with the, the manifold that you see on a lot of the three and a half and five barrel systems down. And that's a direct result of feedback from like folks like me, who they can jaw at and be like, so like, what's the problem? I'm like, well, you know, my back's getting, it's getting hurt a little bit, so let's try to figure out a way to make this design flow more efficient. And, they shot it back to the engineers, and the engineers came up with that manifold, and it works fairly well. So from wheels up to wheels down, Jason will brew day one. Uh, day one through about seven to eight, it'll ferment out. Days uh, eight through 10, it'll crash down to its appropriate temperature and clarify a little bit. Uh, day 10 transfers over to a bright tank, and then between day 12 to day 14 to 15, depending on the style of beer, it's ready to serve. So where we're at in the process is the uh, Vorloff, uh, which translates to? Recirculate. Recirculate. So we're recirculating our wort right now uh, in our mash tun. So we've been doing that for about 20 minutes. Uh, in fact, I'm about ready to go ahead and send it over to that. I'm gonna take a quick sample, uh, check on my gravity and everything. It's kind of the way our dynamic works here is, you know, he, get, he basically gets things ready. My baby over here. And uh, yeah, because oxygen is your enemy. Uh, oxygen is the enemy, that's yeah, right. So. And it's funny because Jason prefers doing hot side in general, and I prefer doing cold side in general. So it, it, we were both just like, oh, this is gonna work out great. Yeah, yeah I, think, <laughs> I, th I, think, I think this is gonna work. Yeah, it's a, it's a changing industry. Um, Corey's helped me figure that part out. 
Um, there's so much that just changes uh, on a regular day-to-day -day basis. And, um, you know, I'm kind of that grumpy old man that tells you to get off my lawn. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm Corey the guy without a shirt, I go, woo, let's do this! <laughs> and it's like, I know, you know, like, this is beer to me. And, you know, Corey comes in like, well, this is beer to everyone else. So he's kind of helped open my eyes to a lot of, like, newer trends and things like that. Um, that, you know, I've kind of been resistant to at times. So you just, you know, never stop learning and never get set, never com get completely set in your ways. We're actually starting to use hops in a, a much, both traditional and non-traditional way now, uh, uh, adding them in parts of the process to derive compounds from them that weren't traditionally derived for the purpose of making, you know, an aromatic IPA. Uh, the yeast in, in conjunction with putting these hops in the mash and other parts of the boil allows us to use uh, lesser um, known, uh, uh, less expensive, and some traditional hops to create some very new world expressions as far as flavor and aroma are concerned. So we have a, a beer on right now called Dial the Tiger. It's uh, an IPA in, in name, um, but in process it's actually not. We use uh, by far fewer hops that in this particular beer than any IPA that we brew by a margin of about 40 to 50 percent just by virtue of um, the advances in yeast technology that we're applying to this particular beer. So I'm pouring our East Highland Scottish Ale. Um, this has kind of always been one of my favorites. It is my favorite just from the standpoint of I have uh, I, I've Trial and error, this has been like the beer I've been most passionate about to try to get right. And uh, plus, I'm personally trying to lead the charge for multi beers to, to come back. And one of these days, it'll happen, but not anytime soon, probably. So my favorite beer at Taser right now is our Say Hello to Heaven Hellesbach. Uh, you don't see a lot of strong light beers in the winter. You see a lot of strong dark beers, your Imperial Stouts, your Barley Wines. And uh, I just thought this was a good way to, you know, have a light beer with a little bit more oomph to it. It's 6.5%, so uh, it gets you it gets you that that heavy beer feeling without being super heavy on flavor. We definitely know that we can we can uh, increase our footprint, sure, um, and expand our distribution and uh, and continue our growth. Um, and as far as my vision for the future of Taze, as long as long as they keep paying me, I'm going to stick around. <laughs>